As you have your Bible this morning, if you would, look to the book of Genesis, in chapter number 4, and put your finger there and mark it. And I also want you to find your place near the back of the Bible, the second to last book, the book of Jude. So look, if you would, at Genesis chapter 4, and look to the book of Jude. I won't tell you the chapter, there's only one. But we're going to look at verse 11 in just a moment. Genesis chapter 4. But before we do, I want us to read Jude in verse 11. The verse here in the New Testament, we should always pay attention to God's Word. We should always listen to it. We should always ask God by His Spirit to teach us in it, to teach us from it. It's only by God's working and by His Spirit that our ears will ever be unblocked, that our eyes will ever be made to see. So ask the Lord to teach us and help us this morning. But I think we have special admonition this morning from the New Testament that tells us to pay special attention to Genesis chapter 4. So if you would, we won't read the whole, I won't even give you all the background of Jude. The temptation there is strong. But I just want you to look at the first phrase of Jude 11. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Jude is admonishing, he is encouraging those that he is writing to. We know that Jude is one of the physical brothers of Jesus Christ. He becomes a believer. He's admonishing the New Testament church. He's warning them of people that have crept in and that have devised plans and schemes that have harmed the name of Jesus, that have taught in false ways. And he warns in a number of ways. He gives a lot of Old Testament uh, illustrations. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. He talks about Moses, he talks about Balaam, he talks about Korah, and those that rebelled against the Lord. But notice that phrase, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Look at Genesis chapter 4 this morning, and I think we're going to see outlined for us the way of Cain. And we should take note of it this morning, as God's Word tells us to do. That's the thought, or the theme of the sermon this morning is the way of Cain, or if you would, the road uh, to sin, away from the Lord. And as we think about that, as we think about the warning signs on the way of Cain, that's our thought this morning. Look at Genesis chapter 4. We were here a couple of weeks ago, and we worked down through verse number 7 and 8. And so if you would, look at verse number 8, we'll pick up there. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. And he lied. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond or a wanderer, a traveler, shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, for Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod. Nod literally means wandering, a wilderness of wandering on the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Erod, and Erod begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. First time that's happened in Scripture. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents or home builders. They now have an established place to live. And of such that have cattle, they're raising livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal. 
He was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ, the lyre, the pipe, musical instruments. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer or craftsman of brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Cain was Neymah. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, from whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. And he called his name Enos, or Enosh. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Father, help us this morning. You have warned us like you warned Cain. That our hearts are prone to wander from you. As you told him, sin crouches at the door ready to devour us. And like Cain, you have instructed us to rule over sin in our hearts by your power. We thank you for the power of Jesus that conquers all sin in us through the gospel of Christ. And we pray for that power today, that it would minister to us through your word, and that it would teach us to rule, to bring into subject the evil inclinations of our hearts by your power and by your grace alone. May you work in us and change us today. Do not just stir our hearts, but change our lives, Lord. We pray that we would be warned by these signs that we see in the life of Cain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been a couple weeks since we were in Genesis together, so I'm going to attempt maybe the briefest of reviews. We talked in Genesis 1 that God created the world and everything in it. Mankind was created distinct from the rest of creation in its purpose, its dignity, and in its design. We, as humans, were created in the image of God. Nothing else is. We were created for the glory of God, and God's intent is that every individual human being in His image would have real and personal relationship with Him. Beginning with the very first people, humans, though, sinned against God. Sin stained each of us, and with that sin comes the promise of judgment. Sin brings death. Sin has made us worthy of God's wrath and eternal death, and yet God, as He did to Adam and Eve, has to all men extended mercy, a promise of salvation. It's made possible not just to the first humans, but to all humans. We learn that Adam and Eve's sin not only affected though their own lives, It affected all of their offspring, all of their descendants, including two of their sons that the Bible highlights in particular. In our last sermon, we learned about Cain and Abel. Both came to present a sacrifice to God as an act of worship. Abel's was accepted. Cain's was disregarded by the Lord. We discussed a little bit about why that may have been. Actually, the Bible in Genesis 4 does not really give us an indication of the exact reason. Is it because Abel's was a blood sacrifice and Cain's was not? We're inclined to feel and think that way as you look at the rest of Scripture. We're not told how and what they were supposed to sacrifice. Other places in Scripture, fruit and food was an acceptable sacrifice before the Lord, but not until sin had been atoned by the shedding of blood. But the New Testament actually gives us a little bit of a hint as to why. Genesis 4, God says to Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted. God comes and confronts Cain. He says, why are you angry? You are not living the way you should. And God shows, He does not just look on the action of their sacrifice, the, the deed of their religious action, but He looks at their heart. 1 John 3.12 tells us this, that Cain killed Abel, hear this carefully, because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. 1 John tells us that it was not just Cain's sacrifice that was wrong or disregarded by the Lord, it was Cain's lifestyle. Something in Cain's life had taken him away from the Lord. He had rejected God. So God comes in the first half of the chapter and He warns Cain, 
But Cain rejected God's warning and deepened his rebellion against God by murdering his brother Abel. A terrible event near the beginning of human history as one brother kills another after an act of worship and a conversation with God. It's proof that we can hear God but not listen to Him. We can be near God but not be submissive to Him. We can hear God's voice but not follow and obey. We can do things considered good outwardly but be rebellious inwardly. Self-righteous religion still condemns the soul. In fact, it's often most dangerous because it convinces the mind that it's okay without God. Cain's story is one that has repeated itself over and over and over in the lives of human beings throughout all the ages of history, not just in anger and in murder, but in rejection of the Lord. Jude 11, we read a moment ago, gave us the warning. says, woe unto them. Warning, warning to them. They have gone in the way of Cain. Made me think a little bit this week as I was kind of preparing. Are we listening to that warning? It's a warning to the unbeliever and the believer alike. Sometimes we don't think warning signs in particular are for us. You know, we buy a tool, man, and it says right on it, do not use it in this way. Do not stand on ladder while holding chainsaw. And we do. We, we, sometimes we don't think a warning sign is for us. And so we ignore it. Came across, a little, little wake us up a little bit this morning. Came across some interesting warning signs. We could do this all day, but I'll give you just a few that I particularly liked this week. This sign says, caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. And at the very bottom says also, the bridge is out, turn around. This sign says this product does contain peanuts. I like this one. Touching wires causes instant death and a $200 fine. I need to know where this is. Calling, uh, caution, falling cows. Uh, free beef. I'm not sure where that is. And my favorite, we just hung over in the kids' ministry room. Unattended children will be given an espresso and a free puppy. And it's unlike the humor in these signs. The warning that we find in the way of Cain and his descendants is serious. But sometimes we don't think that warning is for us. I don't think that I could be anything like Cain. I couldn't murder my sibling. I couldn't reject the Lord to his face. This is not, it's not me. It doesn't pertain to me. But may we this morning... See that at the core of Cain's heart, his problem was simple. Cain was a man without God. He rejected God's way, he ignored God's word, and eventually he went away from God's presence. He was a man that had every opportunity in the world to follow God. And yet he came up with every worldly excuse to reject and walk away from Him. But he had no excuse. And neither do we this morning. So I hope that we'll see the warning signs on the path that leads away from God. I want to approach the passage in kind of three lenses this morning. There's, there's four points or four ideas, warning signs as we walk through the passage. But I want to view each of those four thoughts through three different lenses. Now I know some of you are doing math in your head. You're like four and three. That's, is this 12 points? No, we're going to just look at it through different lenses as we walk through. The first lens is this, the historical lens. What happened in the passage? What are we told? What do we learn from it happened in the history of mankind? Then the second, let's look at it from a worldly passage. And we're actually going to do lens. That's actually what we're going to do kind of together. We're going to look, hey, this is what happened in Cain's life. Now let's look and see how that's happening in our world, in our culture, in our society, and in our country. We're celebrating this week our independence as a nation, the freedoms that God has given to us, and we rejoice in those, and we pray for our country. And I think as we see this passage, and then again next week as we're in Genesis 5 and 6, I think there is a tremendous parallel between what happened in the lives of men early on and what happens even in our nation today as people. So we're going to look through it to those lenses, but then we're going to apply it with a third lens this morning, and that is the personal lens. Not just how did Cain falter, how does everyone else falter, but how do these things challenge 
my own walk with the Lord. So let's walk through them as we look at the passage. The warning signs in the way of Cain. First, number one, notice if you would, phrase it a couple ways, the diminishing of human value, or if you would, the devaluing of human life. When people sinned, they lost the capacity to purely connect with God. They tumbled into the grip of sin and they could not escape of their own doing. God had to make a way of provision for their escape. God established relationship with them as people. But Adam and Eve were separated from that uninhibited relationship with God that they once had known in the garden, that pure walking with the Lord daily, it says, in the cool of the day as He came, they lost that relationship with God and it was severed. And as their relationship with God was corrupted, the relationship between human beings also was corrupted. God had clearly set human beings apart from the rest of creation. He says, they are, we are valuable, we are treasured, full of worth, created for His glory. His intent is not that He's the only one that can see that. His intent for us as human beings is that we see other people in that way as well. That we see people as valuable, created in God's image, full of worth, sinful, yes, but with the opportunity of hope. Only God was supposed to be elevated above the worth and value of men, but sin warped that concept in man. And Cain values himself and his own life and his own cravings more than he valued the lives of those around him, particularly his brother. We see it in the murder of Abel, where he ends Abel's life, but we also see it in Cain's response. Notice he says, am I my brother's keeper? What does it matter? I can't see him. He's not around. What does it matter? He does not matter. But then God states the exact opposite. In fact, in his innocence in this regard or in that instant, he says, Abel's blood cries out from the ground. God does not forget people though they have passed away or though they have moved out of sight the way that we reject and forsake people. He devalues or he diminishes the human value. Cain did not love God rightly. And so he could not value or love man properly. Did you notice the order of that? God comes to Cain and God warns Cain and says, Listen to me. Sin is at your door. Obey by faith. Repent. Sacrifice. Know me. And Cain won't do it. And because Cain does not know God in the way that he should, he does not love God people in the way that he should. We see that in our world today. I think it's obvious. People do not know God rightly, and therefore they cannot love others properly. The devaluing of human life is rampant in our world, in our society today. I mean, there's glaringly obvious. I mean, you talk about the blood, innocent blood crying from the ground. You study in the book of Numbers, it says that the shedding of innocent blood can literally bring curse on the land itself. We are a land that has slain millions of people in the name of choice or in the name of what we want. We have aborted children that are absolutely innocent. We have murdered one between another. We devalue others in how we treat people with our business. Money is more important. Time and power, we use one another. We diminish human value. We look at everything else in this world that God created as higher than the thing that God created in His image. Diminishing of human value. Notice number two. Cain then departs from God's presence. So Cain faces judgment just like his parents. You can't outrun your sin forever. And Cain, it says, is cursed. Did you notice it says he's cursed from the ground? A step further than Adam's curse. God told Adam that the earth would yield fruit to him, but he would have to toil and labor for it. God tells Cain, the earth will give you the land, will give you nothing anymore. Cain had been blessed by the ground. He was a farmer, but he ruined it with his foolish actions. Let me ask you this morning, how many blessings of God have we ruined with our foolish actions? As a society, as a culture, we'll get into it in a moment, even personally. We have ruined the gift that God has given us in land and in marriage and in relationship and in all these different things that God has blessed us with. We ruined them with our selfish actions. 
God blesses the people of this world. He blesses this country, this nation with good things, common graces, but we waste them with sinful choices. Notice that Cain does not show repentance or remorse, though. God gives him this curse. He notes, again, that he, he, God does not reject Cain, and God does not say, I'm going to drive you from my presence. That's never in the curse. He just says, you're going to be a wanderer. You're going to have to move around to find food, whether you become a hunter or a, you bargain with others or you become a trader. You're not going to be a farmer anymore. But God never says in the passage, Cain, you cannot be around me anymore. That was Cain's choice. He doesn't show response of repentance or remorse. He doesn't reflect turning. Makes me think of 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. It says, Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. It says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Cain had sorrow. He was sorry. He wished things were different. He says, my curse is greater than I can bear. There's a difference, though, between being sorry or sorrow over sin and frustration with sin's results. We live in a world that is frustrated with the results of sin, but is unwilling to turn from the heart of sin. We live in a world that is, it's obvious, it is abs the world is absolutely frustrated with sin. Though that you look at the world, you look, we, we indulge in pleasures, we run to wickedness, but we are obviously frustrated. Our country even knows itself that there is a brokenness in us as people and as a society and as a world. We are frustrated by what sin has done to us. We're just not willing to turn to the one that will fix it. The response of the heart of unbelieving people in this world does include sorrow, but not repentant sorrow toward God, but a deep frustration with the effects of sin. And hear this carefully. A frustrated world that takes its frustration out on one another and points its finger at God for being cruel and unfair when He holds people accountable. Sin has a cost. No one's able or willing to pay it. You think about it. Cain, this is what Cain says. I can't bear this. This is unfair. He expresses sorrow at what he's going to experience, but then he blames God for being the one that brought it on him. Your punishment is too great for me. We see that in our world today. Cain is marked by God with the intent of mercy and protection. He did not get what he deserved. God spared Cain's life. He was long-suffering, just as He has been with all people. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack. He doesn't delay His promise of judgment, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's mark, the effect of sin that God put on Cain's life, was not an act of harsh and unreasonable judgment, but rather a sign of mercy. I'm going to let you live. No one, can no one has the authority to take your life. It's a mark of grace. But Cain's response to God's mercy, did you note that? Cain's response to God's mercy is to reject the God that gave him grace. God lets him live. God is long-suffering with Cain. And Cain's response is to walk away from him. Now, think again. We'll look at it through the world lens. This was Cain's choice. When people are unwilling to surrender and submit to God, they wander because satisfaction is only found in Him. Have you noticed the wandering trend in our world today? The rebellion of sinners across the world, particularly in our country, the response to God's long-suffering that He has allowed us to live that He has granted us life, even in the midst of our sin, our response to that is often to get as far away from God as we possibly can. To reject His mercy and to stray from His love and try to go make a go of it somewhere else without Him. That's what we've been doing since the days of Cain. <laughs> that God has given mercy. He gives a path of salvation. But we want something else. 
Our world wanders through a wilderness of distraction trying to make some sense of it. Joy and meaning and satisfaction. But apart from God, there is none. We chase one trending pleasure after the next. Many miserable people in this world are frustrated with the results of sin and the absence of God in their lives, but are unwilling to repent of it. Is that you this morning? Have you been at odds with what's going on in your life in this world, but unwilling to come and know Jesus and be saved by His grace? Cain missed the answer. Millions walked past the warning sign even today. They devalue people. We depart from God's presence. And look, there's, there's only one answer for people today. I'm, I'll take a moment. I, I do understand that there was a debate on Thursday. If you have not heard, two men tried to voice the opinions from two sides on how to fix things in this country, and people have been arguing about it 24-7 since then. Yes, I saw it. Yes, I have opinions on it, but here is my greatest thought, my most significant. What stood out to me glaringly is that neither one of them expressed the real solution to any of our country's problems. The presence of God through the salvation of Jesus Christ is the only answer. Laws could be made today to force people to do good deeds. But until man's heart repents, it will wander from his presence. And when man wanders, it leads us to the third warning sign this morning, which is disobedience to God's word and his design. The text says Cain married. Well, where did he find his wife? We, we discussed that a few weeks ago as our study, we expanded on Sunday evenings. Genesis 5 tells us that Adam and Eve had many other children beside Cain and Abel and Seth. And those children had children. Things worked differently. There was different, longer age. Uh, people were having children into their hundreds of years. So things obviously worked differently. And we should read the Bible in a literal way, but not in a limited way, in the sense that we only read of Cain, Abel, and Seth. And so where do these other people come from? Maybe God did some other thing, some other place. He didn't tell God's Word gives us the details it wants us to know. And what we do know is that Cain marries and he builds a city. And even there, there's this sense of rebellion. God tells Cain, you're going to wander the earth. And Cain says, no, I will not. I'll build a city. I'll name it after my son, Enoch, which means dedicated or, or, or kind of a, a tribute to something. He tributes almost to himself. And so there's this almost rebellion in what, how Cain then continues to live his life. Cain's descendants, we read it a moment ago, some of those really fun names that for some reason no one chooses to name their kids anymore. I don't know why. Methusael and Mahujael, and that'd be fun. But notice that what the emphasis, there's an emphasis. They build homes, they raise livestock, they create music with a harp and a pipe. They have innovation, development. They start to work with iron and metals. Their advancement improves their life and makes it better. Life in this human society begins to grow. Technology, if you would call it that. But wickedness and rebellion increased. Did you notice Lamech then takes two wives? That's where we see the disobedience. God, though he allows it, it does not mean that he approves it. The Bible says in the beginning of Genesis that two become one, not three become some. And you say, well, all throughout the Old Testament, there's... Polygamy, there's this bigamy that kind of begins to happen. Yes, and it is never presented in a positive way in which God endorses or condones or blesses. It always brings heartache and struggle. And yet man here decides what God intended to work a certain way, he's going to make a different way to make it work. He's going to take more than God intended for him. And though Cain and his descendants, you could read it this way, they lived in the midst of advancement and increasing knowledge and skill, but they still chose wickedness. And church, we live in a day of remarkable advancement, but we are flush with incredible wickedness. Our technology is unmatched in all of time, but our insistence on disobeying God has left us as barbaric as our primeval ancestors ever were. We think about the things that you read through. We devalue life. 
two men this week discussing at what point aborting and killing a baby is more acceptable than another, or whether a state should decide or a doctor should decide on when someone gets to kill a child. No, the Bible says neither is right. We say life begins, the Bible teaches that life begins at conception and is purposefully ending it in the womb is murder. We redefine marriage and its purpose. There was arguments on Thursday over the definition of genders, the rights of marriage, whether adultery is acceptable in certain circumstances based on who it was with and when it was. What? We have lost our way. We see a decline in commitment to family, an irrational response to disagreement. You see that in Lamech in just a moment? He disagrees. A man hurts him. A young man hurts him. And his response is to murder. Do you see in our culture today an irrational response to disagreement? Increased violence as a means to conflict resolution. Lamech says as he strays away from the Lord, someone hurt me, so I will murder them. We live in a world that increases in its response, violence in response to misunderstanding or to conflict. When a culture or country departs from God's design, it is destined for judgment. Godlessness propagates sinfulness even in the midst of progress and politics. America is about to usher in its 248th year of independence from England. But I can tell you this morning that our greatest need as a country is to acknowledge complete dependence on God. Dependence on God must include, though, obedience to Him. And that obedience does not begin with following or establishing certain laws. That obedience begins with repenting and believing in the gospel. That is the answer. The warning sign, the final warning sign of Cain is this, number four. You see a disregard for the grace and mercy of God. Lamech says, notice if you would, in verse 24, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold. What's he talking about? Who said that? Who said Cain was going to be avenged sevenfold? Anyone remember? God did. God says Cain will be avenged sevenfold if someone murders him. So get this carefully. Lamech knew what God said. He's quoting here, if you would, the words of God. He is rehearsing the promises of God. He knows them, but he misuses them for his purpose. He defies God's grace and turns it to hurt the others around him. Lamech takes what God meant for mercy and grace and in turn deals harshly and if you would, pretends to be in God's stead. And this is the culture we live in today. It was not about vengeance or personal victory. I have slaughtered someone for wounding me, he says. The wrath is disproportionate to the offense. This is the culture we live in today, consumed with not being outdone. Power, greed, lust, selfishness, it all grips our hearts. We worry most that we have been offended and forget most that it is God whom our sin offends. The way of Cain is to diminish human value, to depart from God's presence, to get as far away from Him as we can, to disobey God's Word and to disregard God's grace and respond in anger toward others. Now, let's conclude. And I see our kids are coming in this morning. It's going to be exciting. They're going to get to take communion with us in just a moment. So as they come in, parents, invite them in and scoot them in with you. We're going to be done in just a minute. But I want us to conclude with this thought. I want us to ask this question. Mankind, perhaps the majority, God says, we have been warned by His Word. Well, look right here. Mankind, the majority, has missed it. They've ignored the signs. And I would say it this way this morning. America as a whole in 2024 has missed it. We've driven right past the warning signs, allowing them to be overgrown to where we cannot see them anymore. Out of sight, out of mind. We have pushed God from every aspect of our society and expected somehow to make things work. But I want to ask you this question this morning. What about the church? 
What about you this morning? Have you ignored God's warning signs? Have you followed the way of Cain? So let's just look at them in just an application, simply ask ourselves the question. Have you diminished the value of human beings around you? You say, well, I'm not like Cain. I would never murder anyone. But maybe we would mistreat them. Maybe we would misuse them. Maybe we would hate them. How do you treat people this morning? How do you view them? How do you think of them? God intends that His people, this church, our, these Christians, He intends that we see people as more than dollar signs in our workplace. As more than a problem to be solved. He demands that we see people as more than an inconvenience. He tells us that we are to love one another. So ask yourself, what value have you assigned your spouse this morning? What value have we assigned our kids, your neighbor, your coworker, the person that you disagree with? The person who discussed the debate at work on Friday in a different way than you intend? How do you value the person that disappoints you most? How do you know something's valuable? How would I know what your most treasured object is? By how you treat it. By how you speak of it. By how you look at it. Have you diminished human value this morning in the way of Cain? Have you departed from or are you avoiding God's presence? Cain says, I don't want to be reminded of my sin, so I'm going to leave the one who told me about it. Some of us this morning, we've been with God before. But I ask you, have you known Him recently? Have you been following Him? Or have you left His presence? So how would I know if I've left His presence? Are you in His Word? I don't mean a methodical way of I need to check off the list of studying the Bible. I mean, do you speak to God and let God speak to you? Or have you left His presence this morning? It's easy to point the finger at the world around us or even at America and say God's hand of blessing is being removed because of the sin of a society. But we don't look at our own lives sometimes and realize that I'm miserable because I have left the very thing, the only thing that promises true joy and satisfaction, a real relationship, personal, with Jesus Christ. You pray, are you with God's people? His presence gathers among us as His Spirit is in all of us. Do you, have you abandoned the presence of God's people? Or you avoid being around them for one reason or another? Are you avoiding serving God or giving yourself to Him in some way? Are you avoiding the presence of God? Because the longer you do, the easier it becomes for number three to disobey God. Maybe you've been away from His presence and so disobeying His Word is easier. You found yourself departing from God's design and God's order like Cain left God's presence. I want you to think about your own commitment, His order for your life. We can point to this and say there's value in life, there's order for marriage, and I think that many of us have decent and moral thoughts, scripturally informed thoughts about the value of life and the principle of marriage. But, but what about the order of your life? What about your commitment to the Lord? Do you think the way that God designed you to think is your attitude and are your actions a part of what God's Word has said? Do you obey God's Word or have you excused somehow yourself from some part of it? How are we disobeying God's Word this morning? Individually first, personally as people, but then also as His church. What part of His Word have we neglected to obey? What have we avoided as we have gone from His presence? What part of God's Word have we just taken our hands off and said, eh, what, 2024, it's a different world. Have you disobeyed the Lord this morning? And then finally, have you disregarded His mercy and His grace? Have you passed the warning sign diminishing? How do you think of other humans? Have you passed the warning sign of leaving God's presence? Are you passing the warning signs where you're disobeying God's Word? Are you passing the warning sign by disregarding God's mercy? 
God gave Cain something much better than he deserved. And he has given us much better than we deserve. We as believers have tasted and seen the goodness and love of God. But am I easily offended? Do I find it hard to forgive? Is my temper out of control? Am I so frustrated by the sins of others that I am unwilling to repent of my own? Here's the truth. Some of us, self-included, each of us, we've ignored some of these warning signs this week. And we're headed the way of Cain. Destruction. So what's the solution? I draw your attention to the last verse and then we will join together for the Lord's Supper. Adam has another child. His name is Seth. Seth has a child, verse 26, and he called his name Enos. And then this beautiful phrase to a disturbingly dark chapter of Scripture. The last phrase. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Could it be that this is when men began to pray? Maybe before this they only spoke to God when they were spoken to. Could it be that this is the beginning of gathered worship between one another? Could it be that this is sort of the first sign of corporate worship that men gather together to call on the name of the Lord? What is clear is that there are some people that instead of running away from God ran to Him. And in the midst of progress and pain, advancement and destruction selfishness and greed some men said we belong to God and so this morning let me leave you with that encouragement you can turn away from the way of Cain because of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ may we worship the Lord this morning as we gather to think on his sacrifice with us before we do Give a word of invitation. Let God work in our hearts. Father, thank you for your word. It's clear. It is poignant. It speaks directly to us. So we ask you to work in us today. I'm going to ask you this morning, as we continue in a spirit of prayer, let me ask you this morning, Cain rejected relationship with God for everything else around him. Let me just ask you, is there anyone like that this morning? You can say, I don't understand everything about the Bible, relationship with the Lord, what salvation, as you may call it, is. But I have come to understand this morning a need for the Lord and a personal relationship with Him. Is anybody this morning, you'd say in your heart, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a believer, I've never trusted in Jesus Christ never by faith repented of my sin, trusting only in Him for the salvation of my soul to have a relationship with God. Is there anyone like that this morning? I won't embarrass you, but I just pray for you by way of hand. You'd acknowledge that even within your own heart by simply raising your hand quietly and saying, I know that I need the Lord. I know <coughs> that I need to be saved. Anybody this morning? And Christian, this morning, how many of us this week, we've passed some of these warning signs. We've sensed in our own heart that we have mistreated others. We have disregarded God's mercy and not extended it to others. Maybe you have departed from God's presence. You have not sought and chased after God this week. Maybe you know some way in which you have been disobeying His word. And you'd say with me this morning, just by a quiet, uplifted hand, there's a pass some morning signs. I need to return and call on the name of the Lord. Anybody this morning? Any? Let's ask Him to help us. Father, thank You for Your Word and its work. May You do what only You can do. Open our eyes. Make us to hear. Change us now. Seal in this moment, not just what we will remember, but how we will respond. For it's in Christ's name. By His power we pray. Amen. Stand, if you would, as the Lord works in your heart, whether it's at the altar or here in your seat. May we respond to the Lord for His goodness. We'll sing a verse of invitation and we'll gather for the Lord's Supper together.